Hello and welcome to helicopter training videos. In this short video we're going to talk about the aerodynamics of a helicopter in a hover. This is a short clip from episode 2 of the helicopter training podcast, How to Hover a Helicopter. And you can find that full episode in the description or on our YouTube channel's podcast tab. To understand why hovering so hard and why the helicopter is so unstable and power hungry in a hover, we need to look at the aerodynamics first. Helicopter aerodynamics are incredibly complex, so we're going to keep it relatively simple, believe it or not, and cover what you need to know as a pilot and not a NASA engineer. And to keep things simple, we're going to start with a no-wind hover. In a no-wind hover, the helicopter is relying solely on the relative wind over the blades that's caused by the rotation of the rotor disc, you know, hence the name rotor wing or rotary wing. As the blades spin around, they push the air down to stay aloft, you know, and generate what is called induced flow. Induced flow is like a downward movement of the air through the rotor system, creating a column of air moving down through the rotor. And that's the byproduct of those rotor blades generating lift in a hover. You can see the airflow spiraling down through the rotor disc in this video, and increases in induced flow also increase something called induced drag and requires a large amount of engine power, especially when out of ground effect, which we'll cover in a second. Out of ground effect is when the rotor system is at least one rotor diameter away from the ground. And here the induced flow has no real resistance from the ground, and that can lead to increased induced flow rates and larger vortices that recirculate around the edge of the disc and reduce the effective lifting area of the rotor disc. Both of these things contribute to a reduction in the rotor disc lifting ability through changes in the angle of attack and the effective lifting area. We're not going to get into all the lift vectors and the angle of attack stuff in this uh, podcast episode. Contrast this with hovering in ground effect, which is less than one rotor diameter from the surface. So that would be within 25 feet for an R22, which has a rotor diameter of about 20, 25 feet. Now that surface, it interferes with that induced flow and reduces the induced flow rate and reduces the ability for those larger vortices to be generated around the edge of the rotor disc. So that's going to improve the lifting efficiency of the entire rotor disc and reduces the power requirements to hover. Now these differences can be significant, allowing a helicopter to be able to hover in ground effect with a much heavier load or in thinner air than when they are out of ground effect. And the closer you get to the ground, the more effective this change is. So manufacturers have published performance charts for out of ground effect and in ground effect performance, and they stipulate the hover height for which the in ground effect chart applies. And it's often much closer to the ground than this one rotor diameter we just talked about. For example, the R22 and the R44, their in ground effect performance charts, they don't say within 25 feet, they say within a two foot skid height. And so anything above that, you should be using the out of ground effect hover chart to assess performance. And when operating off airport, it's a good idea to never assume in ground effect performance and to use these out of ground effect hover charts. Now, sometimes you're going to hear people referring to in ground effect and out of ground effect as IGE and OGE, but also you'll sometimes hear them put a H in front of it for hover and they'll say hoagie and higgy, which to me, sounds a lot like a Sesame Street character. Also, something to note is not all surfaces are equal. So a flat, hard, concrete pad has more effect in ground effect than a sloping hill with vegetation or even water, for example. You can see here an accident that occurred in part because the aircraft didn't have in ground effect performance over the water. So if you're hovering out of ground effect, you're going to have a higher power requirement, which is also going to lead to a higher torque reaction. So that's something to keep in mind too. But what exactly is torque reaction? As the engine pushes the helicopter blades one way, the fuselage of the helicopter wants to spin in the opposite direction due to Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Because the reaction is a rotational force in the helicopter, we call it torque reaction. So when sitting in a helicopter pilot's seat and looking out the front of an American helicopter like the R-22, you can imagine the blades move from right to left as the helicopter starts to spin up. 
So that will help you remember that the torque reaction will go the opposite direction. It will try to push the nose right. Now, of course, again, if you fly something like a Cabri, this is all reversed. But back to the R22 and American counterclockwise rotational systems, remember the helicopter wants to spin the nose to the right. And it's the job of the tail rotor and your left foot on that pedal to make sure that doesn't happen unless you want it to happen. And then it's going to be a slow controlled turn to the right. Else you can start to lose control of the aircraft. There's a hazard called loss of tail rotor effectiveness or LTE, which we'll go into in a future episode, but it can cause an uncommanded yaw that can lead to loss of control of the aircraft. For now, you need to know that you must make all pedal turns, left or right really, slowly and carefully and never let the aircraft get away from you. So the pedals control the amount of anti-torque thrust produced by the tail rotor. And any time the collective is raised or lowered, the engine is producing more or less power, which changes the torque reaction on the airframe. So to maintain heading, pedal input must be adjusted to match this change in torque. I can't think about like uh, driving a car and any time you push the gas pedal or brake pedal, imagine that the car swerves to the left or right. And I, I had a car that used to do this. But with experience, this collective and pedal coordination becomes instinctive. But for now, as you're just learning, keep your eyes outside and apply whatever pedal input is required to hold your desired heading. So while the tail rotor counters the torque reaction to maintain heading, it also introduces more aerodynamic complications, something called translating tendency or translating drift. So in a helicopter with a counterclockwise rotor system like the R22, while you're maintaining a hover, the tail rotor thrust acts to the right, and that has the effect of drifting the helicopter to the right. And the more tail rotor thrust or left pedal that you apply, the more that lateral drift to the right occurs. And of course, reverse all this for counterclockwise systems like the Cabri G2. So this drift is countered in a variety of ways, from pilot input with some opposite cyclic, to cyclic rigging, so your center position actually has some input already on the rotor system to also a offset of the main rotor transmission mast. In the R22, I believe the drift is offset by cyclic rigging and pilot input. Whatever the way of opposing this drift often causes the helicopter to sit slightly tilted away from the translating tendency. So the R22 often sits with the left skid slightly low in a hover. But of course, wind and weight distribution can affect that too. So in summary, in a helicopter like the R22, if you raise the collective to increase hover height, generally, you will need to add more left pedal to counter the torque. And that causes additional right translating drift, which you need to add some left cyclic to offset. But that takes some of the vertical main rotor lift to create horizontal thrust and that also starts a slight descent. So then you need to add more collective and we go round and round in a circle. So <laughs> welcome to hovering, right? Lots of small coordinated inputs just to hold position. There's no, there's no secret spot to hold all the controls where everything will stop. It just doesn't work that way. There's just this constant inputs. So there's a saying, people fly airplanes, pilots fly helicopters. Now, if you're an airplane pilot, you might not appreciate that, but there's a lot more hands-on, obviously, in a helicopter than there is in an airplane. And it's challenging, it's difficult, but I think it's worth it. So, as we already mentioned, the lateral position of the helicopter in a hover is controlled by the cyclic control. The main rotor disc is producing enough lift to offset the weight of the helicopter, and if we want to move the helicopter forward or backwards or drift left or right, we need to offset some of that vertical lift to what's called horizontal thrust or horizontal lift to start moving laterally. And that will usually mean that the helicopter will start to settle as the vertical component lift will be less than the way of the helicopter. But assuming we're still in a no wind situation for simplicity, as the main rotor starts to move out of its own recirculation, out of that induced flow into smooth, undisturbed air, the main rotor actually starts to become more efficient through something called translational lift. And even just a few knots of more horizontal airflow can reduce the negative effects of induced flow and start to increase the main rotor lift. This performance boost can also work on the tail rotor too, but it's called translational thrust. And as that tail rotor becomes more efficient, it can require a change in the tail rotor pedals to maintain heading. 
Another factor is the vertical and horizontal stabilizers, if the aircraft has one or both of these. The purpose of the vertical stabilizer is to help maintain heading in forward flight and then load some of that tail rotor thrust requirement. It is also important in an emergency where you lose total tail rotor thrust, say a bird hits a tail rotor, and it gives some, some control uh, in your in forward flight. But in a hover, it can kind of work as a hindrance. Because if the helicopter's hovering sideways or backwards, or there's wind from either side or the rear, it can start to cause the helicopter to weather vane and try to spin the helicopter's nose into the wind. The horizontal stabilizer is actually an upside down wing that creates downforce to keep the helicopter relatively level at higher speeds. So without that, the fuselage would tilt nose down as the main rotor disc is tilted forward at faster flight speeds. Again, in a hover, this can be a problem because if you're trying to hover backwards too fast or you have a strong tailwind, the airflow can catch the surface of that stabilizer and try to push the tail down or up. So always be careful when hovering with a tailwind or hovering backwards. Getting the hang of all this? Well, guess what? There's one more frustration in a hover and that's called the pendulum effect. So the way the helicopter is suspended in a hover by the main rotor at a single point and cyclic input moves the main rotor disc first and because the center of gravity of the aircraft is below the main rotor disc, the body of the helicopter then follows. So this can lead to the helicopter kind of swinging under the main rotor like a pendulum. It's more apparent in a semi-rigid rotor system like those in an R22 or a BOW206. It's also most noticeable when first transitioning from a stationary hover to a hover taxi or a takeoff run. It can also be seen when trying to stop uh, as the body of the helicopter will swing back under the disc. The larger the control input, the greater the effect. So keep your eyes outside and make all those cyclic adjustments small to fix the attitude if the nose comes up or drops from where you want it to be. A lot of these problems are made worse by the pilot looking at the ground or nearby instead of out to the horizon where you'll notice even small changes in the aircraft attitude. We've just been looking at no wind situations where there's an imaginary world where there's no wind. But the reality is you'll often be flying with some wind of some amount. The wind will have a similar effect to the helicopter in a no wind situation, but hovering in that direction. So, for example, if there's a wind from the right, you'll be like the helicopter in a no wind situation drifting to the right. There'll be the same effect on the main rotor getting more efficient and the vertical fin will try to turn the helicopter nose to the right into the wind and the stronger the winds get the greater the effect also when we start getting above 10 knots or so wind we start getting into new aerodynamic situations such as dissymmetry of lift and transverse flow effect and effective translational lift but we'll cover those along with other things such as coning and Coriolis effect gyroscopic precession and more in future episodes when we talk about takeoff and landing and involving faster helicopter airspeeds. All of this is to help you understand there's a lot going on in just the hover. So be patient with yourself if you're trying to learn this skill. And before we look at some of the training exercises and tips, we're going to look at what the FAA defines as the minimum standard for hovering to pass your private and commercial check ride or practical test. This clip was just a small piece of what we cover in episode two of the Helicopter Training Podcast, which was a deep dive on how to hover a helicopter. In the full episode, we walk through a few things like the controls in a hover, what each input does and how, hover aerodynamics, we cover some of the weird interrelated forces at play to help you understand why hovering is so difficult. We're also gonna look at the FAA ACS or Airman Certification Standards. That's the check ride requirements that we'll be looking at specifically for hovering. We'll also go into training exercises and drills to help you get to those standards and beyond, as well as tips for both students and instructors. So you can find the full episode right here on this YouTube channel under the podcast tab, or you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite podcast player is. Just search for Helicopter Training Podcast. And don't forget, you can start learning right now on the Helicopter Training Videos YouTube channel with video playlists covering things like ground school subjects, flight maneuvers, as well as following along with a student on every training flight from day one all the way through to check ride, 
If you haven't already, please click subscribe to get all the latest videos and help support this channel. And then finally, for more information, including articles and quizzes and resources, and how to support this volunteer project, check out our website, helicoptertrainvideos.com. Thanks for watching. Fly safe.